<coughs> oh yeah, off we go. Okay, so welcome to the inaugural Desertification Island Discs. I'm Dan Bottrell, and I'm joined today by a very special guest, David Newman. Hello, David. Hi, hi, Dan. How are you? Good to see you. You've joined, where have you joined us from today, David? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful sunny day up here in Northumberland. And, uh, you know, I'm on the coast. Um, as you know, <laughs> with the last few days, we've had, you know, beautiful weather. And the, the palm trees are, are blowing and the sea's inviting. It's a little bit chilly yet, but in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be in there swimming. Yeah, lovely, lovely. I, I'm in London, as you can see, Canary Wharf. Uh, like, I've just stayed here because I'm a yeah. I'm a, uh, I can't yeah. leave behind. So yeah, I know it's it's a tragedy what's happened to our cities. You know, and as they've become hotter and hotter, people have left them. It's 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 really hard to live in them. Absolutely, absolutely. So so thanks, David. Well, first of all, obviously, you know, the idea of this little chat is it's a bit tongue in cheek, really, but there is a serious message behind it all. Um, but our aim today really is to get to know you a bit, talk a bit about your background in sustainability, what makes you tick, um, and also just to kind of have a bit of fun, really. So uh, as you can see, it's a completely original idea, this, developed by us at Ditto Sustainability. No one's ever tried this before or anything like it. So it's uncharted territory. So we'll, we'll kind of give it a go and see and see where we, get, we end up. Um, but for those of you that don't know David, just a bit of a, a kind of background, David, um, I think would be good. Um, I first met you probably about four or five years ago. Um, you were speaking in Amsterdam at uh, a conference. And I remember thinking, leaving that meeting, thinking, wow, this guy knows about sustainability. Um, he know, he's fi finally I've met somebody that can teach me about the circular economy or understand what the circular economy is now. So I'd kind of recommend anyone out there to go and, and, and have a listen to David if you see him talking, because he's very passionate about it, very experienced in this area. Um, and yeah, I, I think a lot of the things that I heard David talk about that day things that really helped us inspire the roadmap for Rio, our, our product moving forward, especially from the, the circular economy perspective. So, so yeah, so David, you know, you, we we're, were part of your fan club. Um, well, thank you for your kind words. Thank you. I just, somebody said to me the other day, you, you know, you, uh, you say, you say things so well. And, um, and I, I took that as a comment and my reply was, well, you know, life's too short to, to, to tell each other lies. We are adults, you know, we have to tell each other the truth. And, um, and I tried to sexually, tell the truth i suppose in but how i see the truth anyway i think so and i think um, the way the way you're coming at it is you know is it's from a sustainability perspective i always find as well it's not it's not a purist hippie eco perspective it's it's a balanced kind of practical perspective also um you might disagree with me saying that but that's that's the way i look at it i think it's um the the kind of logics ingrained in the economy and in, in terms of um what the global economic footprint looks like, how that's how that's moving forward. It's all it's all kind of anchored in some sense. Um, so, how, how do you feel about that? Because I know you, your background as well. You interestingly worked in Greenpeace, didn't you, in Italy, kind of earlier on in your career. So in the nineties as well. So you obviously got something kind of deep in there from a from pure environmental perspective. But how would you kind of describe yourself now? Would you, you know, I'm I'm, I'm finishing a, a a book which is called Everything Is Connected, and, and it talks about the, the various environmental challenges which the world faces and try to put them together and of course the connecting issue within within each each of the issues is money mm -hmm. okay now I, I really say in this book quite clearly this is not a tirade against the capitalist system or against people getting rich hey we all want to be well off we want everybody to be rich the, the question is how we use that money uh, and and where we employ it and if we employ it in destructive uh, activities then we are actually, and as we have seen with the coronavirus, harming ourselves. So even from a purely selfish point of view, to pollute the air, to pollute the seas, and to cut down the forests is actually destructive of our own civilization. Mm. Now that doesn't mean stop everything, stay at home and, 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 and become a hippie. It actually means, no, let's employ our capital where it doesn't pollute. And you can make money out of solar panels and out of wind turbines and out of you know a million different types of things which is not going to are not going to destroy the planet absolutely and uh, i guess that yeah so so where where do you stand on in this global warming versus climate change debate and and i guess in particular it's obvious that you know you you kind of you obviously believe in it and you can see the science behind it but what do you think about those people that don't quite recognize the importance of it well, I think there's, 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 there's two categories of people, aren't there, uh, Dan? Um, the first category, you know, looking at it now from 2050, 
were those were those people who who, who really were ignorant of the, the issues, and I don't mean that in a nasty sense. I mean they didn't understand them. Okay, these are complex. These were complex issues. We couldn't see it um, happening uh, clearly, and and it's and it's clear that a lot of people uh, are not perhaps informed or educated enough to have understood it. And and you know now looking at that at a distance of of, of, of you know of thirty years away. Um, it's clear that those those people are very very few because they've lived through this last decades of climate change and they've all got the message. Then there are that category of people, and it's a very small but very influential category who are in bad faith. They know that climate change is happening. Um, they know that it's disrupting our lives. They know that it's disrupting the planet. They want to deny it because they want to continue with their business models. Those people make me want to throw up. They are criminals. Absolutely, absolutely. So, w what what could we have done to, you know, let's say we are, you know, obviously in twenty fifty now that things have got serious, things have got bad. Um, what should what should those people have done in twenty twenty that that then you know that they didn't do? What well, kind of, what would have made the biggest difference? Do you think? Well, what's astonishing, Dan, is is not twenty twenty. Um, I'm an old man, all right. So, what's astonishing is in nineteen fifty six when I was born, and in nineteen 68. Uh, 1956, Edward Teller, who was a nuclear uh, physicist and one of those who built the bomb, declared that burning fossil fuels and putting CO2 into the atmosphere would change our climate. And in 1968, the, uh, the American Science, Science Council went to President Johnson with a report which then said, we will reach 400 parts per million of CO2 by the year 2000 and 800, million, 800 parts per million if we burn all the fossil fuels there are, and that will be an absolute catastrophe for our climate. Now that was when I was a kid, mm. we knew it. And it, there is a very clear narrative of how the oil gas, less gas, but the oil and coal companies have made sure that that knowledge has remained either uh, has, been, has, has either been classified as, 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 as untrue, they've, they've, they've made a lot of doubt about it, they've put up skeptics, they've put up climate change deniers, or they've hidden it away. And there is a, com a complete chain over the last 50, 60 years of the oil companies hiding it. And they pay off the politicians, they pay hundreds of millions of dollars in lobbying, they've been hugely successful, and look at the mess we're in. Mm -hmm. So what could we have done? Uh, we could have stopped um, the first thing, we could have stopped all the subsidies to the fossil fuel industries. And those subsidies are huge. Some 6% of global GDP back in, 19, back in 2020 was going to fossil fuel industries to, to produce the fuels which are creating this mess mm -hmm. with our taxpayers' money. I can't get it. I mean, I think I'm reasonably intelligent, but I never really understood it. Here we are fighting climate change, and here we are giving subsidies to the people who are creating climate change. And, you know, maybe you are more intelligent than me and can explain it. I can't get it. No, I think, I think there are some real perversities in the system. And I was looking at it in terms of air travel was one of the things I, I was looking at the other day and thinking about in that when I was young, we, I was brought up in Hong Kong as a kid. And we'd, you know, fly back from Hong Kong to, to England in the summers to, to see the family, etc. Um, and the airline ticket in kind of total cost terms was the same price then as it is now <laughs> in pounds. Um, and so how, how is that, A, how is that possible economically? Um, and B, the other side of this is why should we expect that a flight costs 50 quid or 100 quid to get us somewhere? Yeah, I'm looking, yeah. Is that not the biggest kind of cultural issue that we have to, have to address here? Because we've, yeah, well, we've, we've, we've all, you know, I've flown to Rimini to Eco Mondo. You know, I've, I've done that cheap flight and I've come back and yeah. I've, actually, I've actually flown up to Scotland for a meeting because uh, yeah. I, I can trust the rail system. We've all done these things, right? But here's now the time for us to go, actually, we should pay more now. We know we should. Well, I, I wrote a blog about it a, a couple of weeks ago. And, I, and, and in this, I said, we have to get used to the fact that we really have to tax out of existence polluting activities. And we have to use those taxes to make sure that low income people have access to mobility. So if you're going to fly to Rimini, it's, it's a thousand pound return. Yeah. 
you can afford it, few people will, that thousand pound, 999 of it is taxed, that will go to ensure that we have across Europe railways which can get you to Rimini in seven or eight hours in case you, you can't afford to fly. Okay, why should, why should I, you know, from, from my Northumberland beach now, I don't need to go to the, to, the, to the Mediterranean, but you know, back in 2020, you would have to fly to the Mediterranean really, unless you went to Nice, uh, if you wanted to get there in a day. Um, so why don't we use that, that tax that we put on carbon, that we put on fossil fuels, that we put on air travel, that we put on cars, uh, fossil fuel cars, to make our railway system accessible to everybody and fast. We can go to Barcelona now in five hours from London if we want to, technologically. Like, why aren't we? Why aren't we? And let's do what Luxembourg has done. It's made all public transport in cities free. Yeah. Um, and so price the goddamn car out of it so that people take public transport. Then if you're rich and you want to use your car, fine, you pay for it. That's okay. But we shouldn't punish poor, poorer people who can't afford it by reducing their mobility. Absolutely. So I guess this probably links into a bit of this, the, uh, the, the vanity element of sustainability and kind of green, greenwashing, eco-washing. Um, and I guess carbon offsetting is firmly in our, our sights now from that perspective. Um, what's, your, what's your view on the kind of the carbon setting, offsetting and the, the net zero agenda as of 2020? <laughs> Listen, I, carbon offsetting, if you mean, you know, com uh, companies buying up, you know, pieces of woodland and planting trees on them. Um, you know, the, I think the judgment's out about whether some of that works and whether some of it doesn't. The fact is, Dan, it's, it's, it's really a way in which companies can feel good about themselves and make themselves look good towards the public and towards their consumers. Is it having any significant impact on reducing carbon emissions? The answer is, of course, absolutely none, none whatsoever. Is it better than doing nothing? The answer is yes, probably. Actually, it is. Yeah. So is it, yeah, you've got to actually do something because it, because I, I, in theory, you could just not do anything, carry on normally and just pay a bit of extra money and feel better about yourself and say you're net zero because you've offset everything. And that's what exactly. we've got to move away from, right? So yeah, exactly. generally doing things, generally implementing efficiency, resource efficiency and, and sustainability. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a, listen, I, I don't want to be negative because there's a lot of really good people who have got their hearts in the right place who are really trying to do good things, okay? You guys are amongst them, but there's a lot of, you know, positivity going on. And, and in the book that, I'm, that, I'm, that I've finished this summer, uh, you know, for example, forestation. Forestation is a huge success story around the world. Um, we've, you know, globally, we've reduced the loss of forest dramatically over the last decade. And we're planting millions and millions of hectares of forest uh, everywhere across the planet. Of course, then we're losing tropical forests in the Amazon to idiots like the, 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 the Brazilian president and, and in Indonesia because of the corruption and, and in Russia. Um, but we are, but there is a huge success story to, to tell about forests. So let's not be negative about it all. Um, sitting here in 2050, uh, of course, it wasn't fast enough. That's, that's the problem. It wasn't enough and it wasn't fast enough. And I guess in the, in the 2020 scenario, um, obviously the, the kind of the, the current timing's been hit by the whole COVID-19 pandemic but um, what, where do you think we were going or heading in the short term around the circular economy agenda you know because that's something you're passionate about something that you you talk about a lot um, were we seeing successes was it moving in the is it moving in the right direction um, or um, is this gonna you know is this gonna knock us back a long way what's currently going on as an excuse I, I had the privilege of being a sort of distant friend of um, Michael Browngard, who wrote the book, um, not on the circular economy, what was it called? Um, cradle. Cr cradle to Cradle, that's right. You know, so I think, I guess now, 20 years ago. So that was the sort of, you know, first circular economy model. And again, whilst there's lots and lots of examples of, of, of companies and products um, looking at or actually implementing circularity uh, policies and products, overall, um, this is not happening at a global scale. If you look at the circularity gap report, which was presented in Davos every year for the last two or three years, the circularity gap is increasing, not decreasing. So the planet actually is recycling some seven or 8% in 2020 of the raw materials and the resources it uses. In other words, Dan, 
it's still more than 90% linear. Yeah. Now we've been talking about circularity because we're in this environmental consultancy and environmental activism uh, arena for the last 10 or 20 years. Mm. But I can assure you that out there, Mr. and Mrs. Smith on living in Bolsover don't have a clue what circular economy means and are not discussing it at all. Yeah. And I think that was one of the, the when I remember that first time I saw you speak and you put that graph up on the, on the wall that showed commodity prices, you know, this whole concept of we're depleting resources. Yeah. Commodity prices going down <laughs> and the whole thing just doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, you know, you think we're getting, you know, we're, we're rushing towards a 9 billion world population and we've done a fantastic job of feeding them all mm -hmm. a fantastic job of giving, health and education to an increasing number of people, a fantastic job of making sure that people aren't sleeping out on the streets. And of course, there's still hundreds of millions of people, you know, poor, hungry and sleeping out on the streets, but we've done a fantastic job globally of bringing people into what we would like to think is a sort of more dignified way of living. Um, and we've done all of that by decreasing the, price, the unit cost of everything we make, including food. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And we still waste loads of that. So where do, where do, what do you think about the the potential just before we go to something a little bit more fun <laughs> the, the the potential success of the sustainable development goals where do you think you know well how successful have they been so far um based on their predecessor and what do you think the future is for those goals um one of my chapters uh, in in my book is dedicated to the sustainable development goals and it looks at the we forget that the predecessor to them was the Millennial Development Goals, which expired in 2015. And the Millennium Development Goals, which were announced in 2000, in 2000, so over 15 years, were phenomenally successful. By 2010, we'd met almost all of them before the 2015 deadline. Um, and so the, 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 the Sustainable Development Goals were, were calculated on, and were, were agreed upon a basis of having already achieved what seemed to be unachievable in the year 2000. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the, the lessons from this, from this for me was that when humanity decides to collaborate and gives itself targets to achieve, it's actually fantastic at it. Mm. We actually really do a very, very good job when we all go for it. Um, it's, of course, it's, it's when we divide and we don't go for it together that, that calamity ex uh, exists. So where are we today with the sustainable development goals? Well, it's, it's a little bit too early to, 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 to say because they were adopted in 2015 and really countries only adopted them into their own, into their own policies in the last two or three years. But the, the UN Secretary General in his last report on them in 2019 uh, highlighted a lot of positive uh, aspects, for example, access to education, access to medical care, um, increasing... Um, uh, gender equality uh, uh, across the globe and so on. And, and he highlighted a lot of um, disappointments and a lot of failures. And most of those failures came down to the fact that we're not investing enough money. Um, so, you know, whilst you have uh, increased access to med medical care and, and training of, of doctors and nurses, uh, as soon as you pay for those doctors and nurses to be trained in third world countries, they're getting on an airplane, they're coming here. Mm. And so actually the number of doctors and nurses that you've got in developing countries that they are paying for, their education is declining. And the number of teachers that you have is declining because the, the budgets for the education system are insufficient um, and, and so on. So, you know, the, we, we really need to step, to make a step change if we're going to, by 2030, achieve a lot of those goals. But we can, mm -hmm. we can. That's the important message. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, I think now we'll, we'll jump into the, some of the, the fun bit. So um, we, gave you the, we gave you the easy task again. Um, so you had to pick seven songs, you had to pick a box set, and you had to pick a gadget. And this, was, this is what you had to pick that day that you were told you've got to leave your home, you've got to get out of here. And these are all you, all, you, all you can have in terms of your worldly possessions um, that are luxurious, shall we say. So, yeah. so it's a tough one, and, and you know, I've seen your, seen your choices, and they're very eclectic, shall we say. So why don't you to tell us a bit about your choices? And just, I should say, actually, that um, David's songs playlist is going to be available via Spotify and Apple Music playlist. Oh, you poor, you poor people, you poor people. So I'm, I'm, I've already listened to them. <laughs> it was in my prep, reading your CV, it's what I had on in the background. So, but yeah, tell us, tell us a bit about it anyway. 
Well, I mean, the, the first thing is that, uh, you know, knowing that uh, Wi-Fi had broken down, I, I couldn't take my iPad with all my songs on them. So I had to choose <laughs> some of the albums and uh, um, I chose, um, you know, some of the, some of the more long playing uh, CDs and, and even vinyl albums, which, uh, you know, the old rock concertos and, and, uh, and also lots of symphonies and such like. Mm. But in terms of songs, you know, you, you want to hear about songs. Well, songs have different meanings to people and, and they have meanings in my life at different times in my life. So there are, there are certain songs that I chose because they are, they've gone through my life and I, I still, as an old man, listen to them. And the first of those is, goes back to my parents' days in Rockhampton in Australia. I grew up as a child in, in, in Queensland in Australia. And uh, I remember from early days, a jazz tune by a, a Dave Brubeck quartet called Take Five. And I remember that because my mum used to, when I heard it on the radio, she used to pick me up and dance me around, <laughs> around the living room because, uh, and cry to it because she was so homesick. And, um, excuse me. And uh, that's been an, an, an up, I'm sorry. That's all right, it's okay. So, that's an abiding memory for me. Yeah. Then, yeah. Um, does, then of course, you know, you grow up and you, you become a teenager and suddenly you realize there's a difference between boys and girls. <laughs> and, um, and around about that time, I suppose, when I was a young teenager, the, um, the Beach Boys song, Good Vibrations, was, was probably bouncing around. And, and <laughs> you know, that, that little blonde girl with butt, butt teeth and, uh, and, and freckles on her face was the love of your life when you were 12 or 13 years of age. And, and Good Vibrations was probably around about that time. Excellent. I love that record. Love the Beach Boys. Yeah, and perfect for where you're where you're where you're living now. The surfing that you can do. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not a great surfer. I, I tend to sort of fall in the water all the time. But uh, a lot of the young people are out here surfing. They have yeah. to be careful of the sharks, of course. <laughs> yeah, those pre those prehistoric monsters have come back into ascendancy, haven't they? Somewhat. Then, at the, then at the end of the, the '60s, when I was sort of growing up, the, the song which I don't think really I understood at the time, but as as always remained in, um, in my memory is I Am The Warrus by The Beatles. Um, and they, they said that they wrote these lyrics to confuse people so that people would go away and study them and not understand them. And, and, and I've never understood them. It's a long time now. It's, it's almost, what, 70 years. But um, the, the sort of, the, the, the confusion, the chaos which there was, I remember as a kid on the end of the, you know, the Vietnam era, era and the, and they're coming into the 70s and the, the, the Cold War era and the peace protests and such like. It sort of summed it all up. Um, and, it sums, and it just brings that memory back to me so, so clearly that, that time, you know, before you were born, but, you know, that, that time when, the, when we, you know, we didn't worry about climate change. We actually worried about getting nuked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think we worry about that quite as much now, do we? No, no. Maybe, well, if if Kim Jong's not there anymore, which uh, is in the news, but anyway, I hope, um, hope he's far enough away. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know that 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 era. There was some great rock and roll music, and if, you know, I, I still, as an old man, get up and dance to Led Zeppelin's "Rock and Roll." It's just, mm. it's just the great, easiest, best rock and roll song ever. I think it's 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 really fun to dance to. It has no meaning to it. Who cares? But it's it's great fun. <laughs> oh, that's that's incredible, aren't they? Yeah. What, do we, what do we have now that can compare with Led Zeppelin? Well, there's some, uh, a, couple, a couple of um, more romantic, or, or, or certainly a very romantic song from Van Morrison. Now, I could have yeah. put the two Van Morrison albums, which I love, Astral Weeks and Veed and Fleece, uh, the whole albums I could put on there, uh, absolute wonderful songs. But this rambling song of, you know, you don't pull no punches, but you don't push the river. I don't know if anybody can ever interpret or understand anything that Matt Morrison is saying. Don't ask me to. But it's such a lovely, a lovely love song, and it's uh, it's got a great rhythm to it. I think about my wife when I think about this, and uh, it's just just a wonderful romantic song. Oh, we had Moon Dance as our first song at our wedding. Me and my wife, which is a, a good one. Yeah, that's a lovely song too. So, yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, and 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 ruins. Um, you know, I, I go back to the sort of environmental aspect here and Cat Stevens wrote a lot of you know very nice ballads and love songs etc um, but he wrote two songs one was Peace Train and the other one was was Ruins in, on different albums and Ruins has remained in my in my head and I think it's very apt for this moment in time 
and especially sitting where you are with the background you've got, um, you know, and, um, and he sort of finishes it, you know, um, well, you'll have to listen to it. Otherwise I'm going to sort of yeah. become, emotion, become emotional again, but, uh, it's got a lovely, it's got a lovely, um, you know, last few, last few words in it, which are beautiful. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and finally London, you know, I, I miss London terribly and, um, and I know it's an uninhabitable place now in 2050, but I, I remember this song from the editors, um, which was, I suppose, around about 2015 or 2016. And, you know, in this light and on this evening, London is the most beautiful thing I've seen, something like that. Mm. It's, a, it's, you know, it's a rather sort of dark sort of song, but the message is, is, is really clear. It really is, a, you know, a, 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 an ode to this beautiful city. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's great yeah great choices I'm yeah really looking forward to listening to those again um yeah so but you, but, you know I come back to the rock operas if you will allow me and you know I, and, I, and I, I still listen to because of course you know rock you know rock music is in your childhood isn't it it's when you're a teenager you know and so I I, I listen very much to Quadrophenia and that old battle of the of the mods and the rockers on Brighton Beach and um you know and songs and the, the albums by by Pink Floyd and and yes, and King Crimson, you know, these are sort of rock operas of our, of our time, of our youth. And, uh, and I still have those very, very close to me. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I, I, well, when I was growing up, my parents always had, had well, my dad had quite, I'd say, quite similar taste to yours, actually. Um, <clears throat> but I do remember, like, the, yeah, the, a, lot of, a lot of the Beatles. <laughs> that, was, that, was all, that was a lot, but how can it not be? So. Sure the finest songwriters ever yeah. probably. um but i love the eagles as well and things like that you know yeah, those yeah. Bands. so um but yeah no, it, like fascinating thanks for taking us through those um and, and then choosing, choosing seven songs you know so easy isn't it yeah over, <laughs> over a lifetime is not easy here yeah. it's impossible but those you know if you had to yeah so you know you, sometimes we have to make tough decisions right so yeah um and then you've gone and broken the system already in our first inaugural kind of pilot episode, we asked for a box set. So what have you given us now? And bear in mind, you know, making electricity pretty easy now, you know, with solar panels and generate diesel generators that are lying around all over the place. Um, <laughs> you decided to ignore that. And what have, what have you taken and stuff? Well, you know, I'm not a great lover of the television and I, and I, and I'm, you know, I, during at the time that you were locked down there with the coronavirus, I, I, I watched more of it than ever I have in my life. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I really have not box set anything. I, I, I mean, I can possibly think about one or two that I remember, but uh, nothing that, nothing that struck me enough that I'd want to continue to see it. Yeah. But there are, there are some books that I continue to read and I've read time and time again. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm going to sound like a really boring old fart, but, uh, you know, War and Peace by, by Tolstoy is just an absolutely magnificent book. Uh, you know, I got, a, I got a degree in modern history and, 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 and reading of that Napoleonic period, but, you know, in the detail of how people lived mm. and in the detail of how people fought and how people killed each other and, 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 the, and the wider sort of panorama he gives of, of Napoleon sweeping across Europe and then sweeping back. He gets to Moscow, he wins the war, but he's lost. Yeah. He's defeated. It's quite extraordinary. And it's, 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 an, it's an absolutely amazing work uh, to distill it into a thousand pages. Um, I think it was um, Woody Allen who once said, uh, yeah, I, 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 I learned to speed, speed read and I read War and Peace in an hour. There's a lot of snow and Russians in it. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. a, there's a lot more than snow in Russia. <laughs> um, and and the, the other fantasy book that I've, I've always loved is Lord of the Rings. Um, it, it really is a, is a great story. You know, the story of good and evil, um, monsters against humans, um, and uh, the little men save the day in the end. It really is a beautiful, a beautiful book, and it has, uh, you know, happy endings and such like. And Austerlitz is one of those books which I'm going to pass over very quickly because I get very emotional about it. Read it. It's an absolute work of genius. It's about the kinder uh, transports. Okay. It's just an absolute stunningly written 
work of genius. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that box set. Uh, Joyce there, David. <laughs> First of all, it's excellent reading for people. Uh, you might want to tag on James Joyce Ulysses to that list, I guess. Um, I, bought it, I bought it about half a dozen times and I never <laughs> ever read it. But there's a lot of people I gave it away to and I, I guess know, they but, never read it either. <laughs> I remember I, w I won a prize at school when I was uh, 15 or something and it was like a book prize and uh, you had to yeah, choose your book you wanted and then it was presented back to you and they had the like the local, the bishop came and, and you know gave out these books and awards and I chose James Joyce and Ulysses just went for the most pretentious choice I could think of and he, he didn't talk to anybody apart from me and he said that's such a great choice son it's such a lovely book you'll really, you'll really get onto it I've not got past the first chapter no, it's it's awful. Awful. It's awful. <laughs> really struggled I think it's shaving for the first chapter or something it's, yeah, it's, I, anyway I, I, I'd like to meet somebody who's actually read it. Yeah, yeah I know. I need, maybe I'll read that, a review of it. That's the way to do it. <laughs> um, so um, I guess, okay, right, finally then. So if you know, you're cynical of the technology capabilities up there by the coast, so gadget-wise, if you're choosing a gadget to take... Well, I've got a, a beautiful hand-carved uh, knife. Uh, it's a fold-away thing. I, I should have got it for you to show you. Um, and it's, uh, I bought it many years ago and I'm very attached to it. When I go out walking, I take it with me. And, uh, um, and it's, uh, it's so important to have a knife, you know, to these, you know, the summer evenings that are coming to, to sit by the beach and, you know, carve, carve a bit of wood and just meditate. But also when you're cooking and, um, and you know, um, you know I, I go out and collect coconuts from the trees and things like this and getting up a tree and cutting down the coconuts. And having a knife really is, is um, it's just a it's a comfort gadget, um, you know. I, I can't do with my I can't have my iPad anymore because Wi-Fi is screwed up. Um, it's just a comfort thing that I, I feel you know happy to have it with me. It's good so good for self defence with all those crazy animals around now. That have, uh... Well, there's not many animals left, and you know we wipe the forest out, and apart from you know feral cats and dogs, there aren't very many left. True, that's true, and the locals. Um, there's lots of feral locals <laughs> yes <laughs> oh all right well i think so what we'd like to do just to finish off david is actually just get a get your insight on a couple of things for people so one of, one of the things we're trying to do with with ditto and rio is is help people to to live more sustainably like whether you're an individual or you're a business so how do you actually um how can you be more sustainable so from your perspective you know if there's an individual out there looking to to live their life more sustainably, what would you, what kind of things would you recommend they look at or do? You know, it's, I'm sure that people who are, are listening to you and I, Dan, are possibly already, you know, moderately well informed. And so nothing that I say will be of any surprise to them. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is about just living modestly. Um, and, you know, you, you don't need, um, uh, to have you know a big four liter engine car, um, you don't need to go on holiday you know ten times a year flying all over the world. Um, you know you you don't need to eat steak every day and, and, and such like. Um, and it's about living modestly um, and, and 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 trying to think about some of the choices you make. And when when you do make them the first time, actually you get used to them very quickly. You know so you know my wife and I we hardly we hardly eat any meat now. Uh, we we just sort of wiped it out of our diet, and it's you know we eat fish, um, but um, it's it's actually quite easy to do. Um, we eat a bit of meat occasionally, fine, but you know not every day like like one did. Um, we don't have a car anymore. Uh, well, we've got nowhere to go. We're old people, um, so we don't need a car. We walk around. Um, thank God there's still a bit of public transport left up here, and we can we can use that when we need to. Um, you know, of course. We don't fly anymore. There's, you know, south of here um, is, is, is pretty horrible. Um, you know, look at London. Uh, and, and when you go to the Mediterranean, it's all desert anyway. Yeah. So where would you go? So, you know, when, when you start to do these things and, and you, you start to think about living modest, modestly, that's all it is. It's actually about living modestly. Um, and, and if you do, you know, let's come back to 2020. And, you know, when you go to the shops and, and buy things, we all need furniture. Well, make sure that the furniture comes from a, sustainably sourced, certified sustainably sourced forest, if it's wood. Um, you know, make sure that you buy things which, as much as you can, which have, have been used secondhand and recycled and reconditioned before you go out and buy a new one. Um, look how 
energy consuming your fridge or your or your washing machine is going to be um and 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 and, and look at your food and, and choose if you can and where it's affordable organic uh, it makes a big big difference not just to the quality of your health and the food you eat but also to to farming and to the quality of soils and and the water that uh, that uh, flow off of, uh, of farms um so you know there's there's just lots of these little things. And if we were to do them as many people are doing more and more and cumulatively more and more, it will make a big impact. Mm. Any, uh, okay. But no, absolutely. Um, um, I think we've all met with the, in the current time with the COVID, we've all managed to adjust our lives to live probably perhaps a bit more simply. Um, I think from my, speaking from my personal perspective, um, you know, a lot of that's been great. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, avoiding travel, who wouldn't, you know, a normal hour, hour, hour and a half commute into London. Um, that's great, and having to do that, put it that way. Um, yeah. So, All right, you know, in, in this article I wrote a, a, a few weeks ago, I said that, you know, as we're doing now, that the, the day of seminars and, and the day of, you know, meetings is, is, is gone, it's finished. Yeah. Anybody who owns an office block better think about turning it into houses because people are not going to go to the office anymore. Why would you? Yeah, it makes you feel for WeWorks and places like that, doesn't it? Where, not, you know, not really. I don't feel for them at all. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> seriously, um, you know, yeah. offices are going to be heavily overdimensioned now. Uh, people mm -hmm. are, you know, people are going to be moving out in 2020. People are going to be moving out of big cities um, because they don't need to go into them so often anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I, I just think, you know, from the, the having run and set up, quite a few startups or businesses from startup that you will often have this thought that you all need to have an office or you need to get together i think what this proves is you absolutely don't if you're working ag with ag agility and you're using and embracing technology there's no need for that expensive office in the center of london um it just doesn't make any sense financially um you should all obviously still do i think one thing we are missing is people contact at the moment but sure, sure. we will get that it'll just be less frequently and it'll be higher quality um, sure, sure. So yeah, I, I kind of I agree with you there. Um, I, was, I was speaking to somebody the other day who sells uh, soft, software technology, and he was saying to me, you know, I'm in one country, all my customers are in another country, and you know, normally I would be on a train or a plane going around and meeting them. He said, yeah. that's never going to happen again. We've all got used to the fact that they're buying my technology, and I'm talking to them exactly like you're talking to me now. Absolutely. Um, and they don't actually want me to come to see them anymore. There's no need. No, absolutely. So, you know, that question was, you know, from the consumer has gone into business, but yeah, is there any, you know, what, what about from a business perspective, if you were trying to, if you were giving a business any tips on how they could be more sustainable, where, where should they start? Um, you know, the, I, I was with BrewDog, I don't know if you know BrewDog, the, the, the brewing company a few weeks ago, and I, I'm talking to them about what, what they do. And, um, and I said to them, you know, you've, you've got a, a lot of energy consumption because, you know, you're a brewery. So look at that. How can you reduce your energy consumption to, a, to a, a, a minimum? And how can you make sure that energy consumption is coming from a renewable resource? Secondly, you've got a lot of waste because you're a brewery. So you've got a lot of the stuff which comes out the other end that people aren't drinking uh, from the brewery process. What can you do with that? Well, we sell it at the moment as animal feed. Okay, well, perhaps you can make energy out of it too. So you can perhaps become a, a self-supplier of energy mm -hmm. uh, using that, 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 that waste. Um, um, uh, before you actually think about using it as, a, as an animal feed. Um, and we should be you know, eating less animals anyway. Um, and then they got a lot of tin cans and, and glass bottles uh, from the product that they sell. Well, there you really can't do very much because once people take that away and they put it in their homes, it does not, you lose control of it. But what you can do is you can support politically um, a business model in which there are deposit return schemes, in which there is extended producer responsibility, which makes the packaging pay for all the cost of its collections, and so on. Um, and so that's a political activity which you as a business can un un undertake, and that is to, to push for change, which makes it easier for those materials to return into the economy. Mm. So that was one example. I mean, in every business will have its own, own different model, but it's, it's about energy, isn't it? Yep. It's about the resources you use and using them most efficiently. And it's about trying to make as, as little waste as possible and paying to ensure that that waste is collected. Mm -hmm. David, 
Thank you very much. It's been yeah, you know, a learning experience. This. Thank you for you know being such a good sport and taking part. Um, oh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. And excuse me, being being emotional, but uh, no, look, you know, we, we, we the other news that we, I kind of admitted at the start was David's just been voted number seven in the Resource Magazine Hot 100 of Resource Management Professionals, and oh, which we think is an absolute travesty. Like, how are you not number one in? <laughs> in, in well, I think uh, I, I'm very honoured, uh, you know, given that we have a, you know, I, I run a very small association, a very sectorial association, to even be in the top hundred, um, and so I'm I'm, I'm very honoured with that result. Uh, but I think it's I think that if people have voted for me, it's because I I actually try to 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 tell them, you know, how it is, mm -hmm. um, and you know, you, you, one of the questions you you mentioned to me that you you may have asked me was about, you know, greenwashing and who's best yeah. at greenwashing. And, you know, when I sit in the same room as the, as the guy, and I do, I'm, unfortunately, with the guy from Coca-Cola, or I sit in the same room as with the guys from Exxon Mobile. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't want to end up in prison for murder, but, uh, uh, you know, you, you actually just want to, you actually just really want to insult these people for taking that, just making fun of, 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 of citizens and making fun of the community with yeah. their greenwashing publicity i mean they're making fools of us oh yeah and we, and we bought into it yeah i remember sitting with you with a, a at some conference a couple of years ago and there was a guy from costa talking about how great they were with that and you think of the coffee cups etc and um yeah it's just it's a big bugbear of ours so you know th thanks for naming those people they should be shamed um and we you know we, we should genuinely try and <clears throat> do this properly and find really good best case examples to promote and we've got to recognise, yeah, it's fine to start now and it's fine to just put yourself out there and explain what you're doing and what you're planning on doing. You know, if you, if you have been doing things maybe incorrectly, so what? You know, like just change your ways now, move it to, it's not too late. Well, listen, if we've got one second, I would just say this. I don't care a, a damn that ExxonMobil are making money out of selling gas or plastics or oil or whatever. That's their business model. And if they were just upfront, straightforward, in our face, we sell oil, gas, and plastics. That's our business model. I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is that those same people finance climate change skeptic, skeptics. They finance extreme right-wing groups that fight back against the environmental agenda. That they pretend to us that they actually are looking at alternatives to move us away because they admit that oil and gas and coal, et cetera, is bad for us. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore they, they put out the hypocrisy that they are part of the change. They're not, they are the problem. And it's that hypocrisy, which is absolutely stunning. Um, BlackRock, BlackRock announced, you know, this, this January, how they were going to go on a sustainability uh, crusade. Well, you know, if you if you look at Amazon Watch, which is a website that I, I'm linked into, BlackRock are the principal finances of all the abattoirs around the Amazon basin, where cattle are now grazing where there was forest. They are the principal number one finances. So don't give me this hypocritical crap about you're trying to save the environment when actually you are financing its destruction. That gets me. It's yeah. the hypocrisy which gets me. I saw, I saw that uh, something released a couple, last week or the week before around the BlackRock SDG fund. Um, and when, when you, you know, when I went to look into it, there wasn't a huge amount of information there. But isn't there, you know, isn't the thought of an SDG fund kind of like um, a bolt on vanity projects, given the extensive nature of where all your other assets or investments are? So that you just go, okay, and here's a nice bit that we just do SDGs on. So we'll just yeah, put yeah. 100 yeah. million in there when our trillions are elsewhere. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and probably that 100 million is, can all be written off against tax because it will go down as charity donations. Mm -hmm. So it, will come out of the, it won't come out of the bottom line. It will come out of the tax bill. So in other words, you and I are paying that 100 million, not them. Um, and it's, you know, it's exactly the same as the Procter & Gamble announcement with the big plastics companies that they were putting one and a half billion into, into recycling plastics. Well, it was one and a half billion over five years, provided that other people put in also one and a half billion. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not one and a half billion at all, um, and it's it, you know and and again it's just a drop in the ocean to to compare to to what we need. Absolutely. So they are part of the problem, and if if you can just 
be honest and don't take me for a fool and have an adult conversation about it. We can get to the solutions yeah. more quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a whole theme of transparency here that we can pick up on the next conversation. So yeah, when right. we've been doing this for five years, David, we'll come back to you for that's your job. For our number <laughs> number hundred, a hundredth one of these, if we get that far, we'll do it again with you and see how far we've got. Um, I hope so. I would be I would be, I would be sizzled by then. Yeah, but but listen, thanks thanks so much for your time and 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 thanks for your amazingly eclectic playlist. Um, and um, it's like I said, it's going to be available. We're going to link to it. Um, via the kind of Rio or Ditto Sustainability account. Um, we're going to post these videos up on Rio Engage uh, after we do them. Our intention is to try and do at least one a month of these. Um, so thank you, David, for being the, the first, the guinea pig. <laughs> well, thank, you for the, thank you for the invitation and uh, it's been a it, pleasure to talk to you. It's been great to see you. So until next time, um, everyone be sustainable. See you soon. Bye. Bye.